Welcome to the world of MCA Discovision. To begin playback of a disc, turn the player power on, place the disc on the spindle. Use the play button to start. vision that you be the boss. Now I'd like to show you some of the valuable things your MCA Disco Vision system lets you do. Most persons find it more convenient. Gently pull up as you press down on the center cap with your thumb. You hear a click. Simply plug one jack into this outlet. using these buttons. The DiscoVision player gives you many special capabilities. Stop, play, slow, forward and reverse. Imagine a dog chasing a rabbit around a tree. How can you get there in a hurry? Now you enter the number just like dialing a push-button telephone. Two, six, three, One single frame of picture is now held on the screen for as long as you want. Take as much time as you want, you're in control.
return to the park position. I'm sure you'll find using your new MCA DiscoVision system to be rewarding and enjoyable. I thank you for watching. All right, it wouldn't be a live stream if if, if something didn't go wrong. And in this point, apparently, um, <laughs> apparently, uh, even I don't know. Streamlabs, you select what stream it is. I select the stream for today, and I grabbed the one for the ninth. So here we are. Whatever. Um, it is what it is. Um, it looks like chat is pulling in the correct thing. I spammed the link to the correct one in um, in the chat for the other one. I don't know. This, I, this software is supposed to make things easier, but it ends up just making things harder because it's like dumbing down, uh, dumbing down the config and it just doesn't, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't work correctly. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but There we go. Us. Okay. Okay. We should be good now. Whatever. Anyways. You know, I started 15 minutes early. I checked all the cameras, checked all the audio. Everything looked good. And then it streamed to the wrong URL. So, whatever. Anyways. um, Okay. Let's see. If there's any questions in chat, you guys need to post questions in chat. Otherwise, I go off on tangents, and uh, that's not the point of this stream. But I will talk about random things if I have to. Um, I do have something new coming to the shop that is just a little board that you can use for development stuff or projects. Um, we got a ton of these, and we originally were going to use these on our printer that we were building. Um, and I ended up just using them. We have literally hundreds of them, so they'll literally be like a buck. Um but these are nice little boards that have a little MOSFET on there. I believe they're only rated for up to like five or six amps. It's an IRF 520. Joel, just based on the screw terminals. Um, yeah, that, that MOSFET's rated for 9.2 amps. But this little terminals, I probably, I, I'm going to list these at five amps. Because that's about what these can safely handle. But uh, you can use these to control things like turning fans on and off, um, lights. Um, I'm actually, I actually use a couple of these to control LED light strips hooked up to an Arduino or an ESP. I know you guys know I'm into home automation stuff. Um, but these will be on the shop. They're very simple. They have power in, power out, and then they connect to your control board on a spare I open. So you have the SIG, VCC, and ground. As you can see there, SIG is for signal, VCC and ground, and basically if the signal pin is high or low, meaning no voltage or 3.3 .3 to 5 volts, um, depends on if it lets electricity flow. Uh, but we have a ton of them, and they're nice little boards. I figure out, figured might as well put them on the store. We have boxes of them because we bought a bunch in preparation for building the printers, and that never came to fruition. So if you guys are looking for little boards for like Arduino projects or ESPs, or if you got you know, spare IO pins on a control board. Um, 
these are great for controlling devices. So you can use them for lights, fans, whatever. Um, it's a switch, a higher voltage. So like 12 to 24 volts is what they run on. So anyways, um, we do. So we have some questions now, which is good. Um, let me see here. I am. <laughs> I am dragging ass today, so I'm going to put some of my drink mix in. Otherwise, this is going to be a very low energy stream. Uh, let's see here. I think the first question, uh, well, <laughs> not 3D printer related, but I'll answer it anyways. Uh, Derek Cerullo has asked, what's the name of the soundtrack, which is the music I had for queuing everything up? That was one of Anders... Uh, tracks which his stuff is linked in the description that's from his retro grooves volume three and it's called disco vision i really like that song um i have two people that make music that we have permission to use their stuff from one is uh the anders anger jensen and i'm probably saying his name wrong if you are some reason watching this i apologize i, I try um and then my buddy josh has a little uh, band called from zero to zed he's the one who did the intro music for our um, our intro clip that we saw, and I also play a lot of his stuff on there. So if you guys like eight bit type stuff, um, those guys are definitely people to hit up. They do do stuff other than like eight bit type music, but that's what their claim to fame and popularity was. So, uh, Derek also asked a question. Do I need an air filter in the enclosure for indoor ABS printing? Uh, my answer to that is if you're sensitive to the fumes, yes, I would. Um, we have some higher quality HEPA filters here. They're not crazy. I think they're about $300, but they claim to go down to 0.1 microns. So we have two of those in our print farm. Our print farm is about 460 square feet. And each one of those units says it'll do up to 1200. So we have two of them. Um, and this office is about 250 square feet. And I have one here that's over there. And uh, if you are someone like me who vapes or whatnot it actually does a good job too of scrubbing the air of those particles so it doesn't look like you've been hot boxing your room um it, it's not a bad idea to put a filter it's one of those things where you can do it and it's not going to hurt something if you do it um you know you just be out some money so if you have the money to do it i would recommend it but we do not have filters on our enclosures we keep them closed uh during printing let them cool down and then we also we have room filters so but some people are are sensitive to the particles that ABS gives off and other, even other filaments too. So um, if you are, then it would be smart to invest in a filter. Printed Solid uh, carries, uh, printedsolid.com, they carry what's called the BOFA filter, which is a B-O-F-A. Um, and they work with their enclosures, all the hoses lock into it and everything. Um, and you could even use something like Hako makes a fume extraction system with a HEPA filter and multi-stage filtration for like soldering. And you could use something like that as well to filter your printer enclosure. Uh, but I probably go with the Bofa cause it's, well, you can adjust the airflow on the, on the Hako, but they're about the same price. I'd probably go with the Bofa over the Hako. Um, anyways, let's see here. There's when people were, were trying to get we're trying to get the stream going i appreciate you guys letting me know when things are wrong um because sometimes i try to keep an eye on all my levels and stuff and but sometimes i miss it and i do actually appreciate when people are like hey this is buffering or this is bad or whatever um also if you guys want to share pictures or links or something um then there is a link to the, our discord server in the bottom there's a live streams channel you can post links and pictures in there since youtube does not let you do that uh, but moving on to Javier's question, I'm having an issue where my first few layers are perfect. And then after about my third or fourth layer, I get this rippling effect on a flat surface. Nozzle too close. I have to baby step it. Um, could be one or two things. Usually the simplest thing is you have something mechanical that's causing the Z to bind. So it, you know, your printer told it to step, you know, let's say 0.2 millimeters. If you're at, if you're at a 0.2 layer height and it's just not stepping, or you might've turned on what's called, if you have a bed leveling system, um, like the easy ABL or the BL touch or, or similar, um, you might've turned on the fade height. There's an option in firmware and we have it disabled because it produces really weird issues. Like what you're describing. Um, if you set the value too low, we're having a lot of people setting the value too low and they're complaining that their prints look like garbage. Um, so if you have fade enabled, you want to disable that, um, 
if you do have it enabled and see if the problem goes away. If it doesn't, then I, I would more than likely say it's going to be a mechanical issue. Something could be binding up um, or even intermittent connection with your Z motors. Maybe it's not making good connections, so it's not stepping correctly. Um, could even be, and this is, this is a long shot and I don't see this too often, but it could even be that you have an issue with the stepper driver. Um, if it happens roughly at the same place, it could be mechanical or it could be the stepper driver even running too hot and overheating. Um, or maybe your VREF is set too low. Uh, it could be a number of things, but the most common thing and where you should start would be the mechanical aspect and then the aspect of that the ABL fade option. If you are using that, disable that and see if the problem goes away. So uh, let's see here. You guys need to keep posting questions here. Keep posting questions. I will scroll down and read them. So, and we do have this stream set on low latency. So in theory, it should only be about a 10 second delay between when I say something and you guys hear it. Um, Richard says, what do I not like about touchscreens? I don't like the touchscreens because they don't give you the full functionality that the standard screens do. They typically run their own operating system that communicates with the board traditionally over serial. Some of them, some of them use a quasi serial interface. Like some of the D ones are starting to do that. Um, but in general, they're not well supported in Marlin because either they haven't done the development on it or they haven't been able to, because of the closed source nature of those displays. So, you know, if I want to add a button, you know, for baby stepping or setting my offset. Some people have hacked it on there um, or you just can't do it. You know, like the Creality ones, I'm told, if, I was talking with Scott about this and they're working on their own like unified Marlin UI for these type of screens. Um, but you, you can draw like boxes and options. So, but all that code has to be written and none of these manufacturers have done that. So it's kind of being put onto the Marlin developers to do that. Um, in my opinion... Um, like what we did with the, our, our render three V two, I literally just put a standard screen on it and called it a day because the amount of time it would take me to screw around with trying to get that screen to do what the standard screen does already is not worth it. When the screen costs like less than $20, just swap it out. Um, that's my, my thoughts on there. Um, Eggbert asks, is there a 4K monochrome resin printer you'd recommend? I can't because I haven't tried any. I have heard that that's the hot new thing, that they're supposedly more detailed. They let more light through. Um, I've had really good luck, in, just as a brand in general, I've had really good luck with Anycubix resin machines. Um, so I feel like they would be a pretty solid bet. if I know they have one out, or a couple actually. Um, I, I've been very happy with Anycubix printers overall. Overall, they're probably one of the, they're probably one of the printer companies I've had the least amount of problems with, um, even over Creality. So, uh, TJ Dorman, do we have firmware for Delta printers? No, we do not. It's not something we we haven't touched Delta printers. The the amount of support that would be on Delta printers because they're very complex. They're very complex and complicated compared to uh, Cartesian machines, and they're also not very popular. So it wouldn't be a good allocation of our time. Um. Richard L. asks, have you built an IoT motion sensor? I have not built one. I That's something I bought because they're like $20. Um, I have a couple of Z-Wave ones here, but you definitely could build one. Um, it would An easy one would be you just get there's off-the-shelf PIR little modules that connect to uh, IO pins. You do that with an ESP8266 and put it in a printed case and call it a day. Um, and then you just got to pick what firmware you're running. Uh, I use ESP Home and Tasmoda here. There's a bunch of different firmwares for ESP devices. Um, but I, I like ESP Home because it integrates with Home Assistant very naturally. And uh, for stuff like Wi-Fi outlets, like I usually use Tasmoda. But for other stuff where I'm like kind of going over and doing my own thing and designing stuff from the ground up, um, I usually go with ESP Home. Uh, let's see here. Am I doing beer in the energy drink? No, no beer today. It's uh, 2 o'clock, so um, I'm not going to judge if someone has a drink now, but I'm, it's Monday. Uh, maybe I'll make Monday suck less. Um, Henry Lynn's here, Robbie Mack. I see a lot of people. I'm sorry that I didn't give a, a shout out to here. Someone who retracted messages. Derek and Javier retracted messages. Uh, Ron, John, hey brother, can you show the upgrades to the Sun Lou like the Hero Me on Thingiverse? Um, I am going, so Aaron is taking that machine out later today and getting the easy ABL probe mount for it. Um, once we have that, the firmware will be released. 
So I already have the firmware done for the stock machine, but I want to get the sensor mount designed so people can put the easy ABL on there. And then once I have that, I can take the offsets, put them in the firmware. So you guys will be seeing a firmware update from us this week that will add support for the Sunloot S3 as well. If uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he usually is in the streams. Uh, I found the issue with the KP3. It was a pin initialization issue with... Um, the MKS Robins and I fixed it and it's patched and it's on bug. It's on our uh, 2.0.x dash testing branch on our website, but it's not pushed to the actual official downloads yet. Um, that fix along with the Sunlo S8 support will be coming out this week. Um, but it is, it is working. I was able to find out, find the issue uh, when we moved from 207 to 2072. So the KP3S, or KP3, sorry, KP3, not KP3S. I haven't had time to play with that one yet. Um, but the KP3 will be uh, pushed out for the fix this week. So, uh, all right, let's see here. Uh, next one. Hey, dude, can, I decided to get my Ender 3 working on I have an Ender 3 115. I assume the TH3D Marlin can be used on it. Yes, it can. Uh, that would be, co that's considered the Melzy board. Um, if you guys want to see if the printer you're using is supported in our new Unified 2 firmware, uh, I'm sure most of you guys that are using one are already aware of that site and like the list of printers it supports. Um, but the Unified 2 site is uf2.th3dstudio.com and that'll take you right to the help center page for the firmware. Uh, but the Ender 3 with the 115 board is supported and on the site right now. Um, with that board, just be careful, make sure you have plenty of cooling and your fans working because the E drivers on those like to, like to die. So, um, CC Eurobeat is asking, is the Amazon basics PLA filament good? I'd say it's, it's nothing to write home about. I've bought it. I've printed with it. I haven't bought it again. Um, it worked okay, but I wouldn't go out of my way to purchase it again. Um, Daniel's asking, is a micro Swiss direct drive system for the Ender 5 compatible with a TH3D firmware? Um, I don't believe there's any firmware changes required for that one. I am going to look it up just to make sure I'm giving you the right information, but, um, I don't believe, I don't believe that requires any firmware changes because I think they're still using the same steps per millimeter, but we have a general setting in our firmware where you can adjust your steps per millimeter. So if there's uh, a step change that you need to make for, you know, whatever extruder you're putting on, you can do that. That's natively supported in there. Um, I think a lot of people get confused because they don't specifically see an option. That's like, this is, this is the micro Swiss option. Um, you don't, you don't need to have something that's a branded option. You just need to know the settings to put in. Um, I'm looking at their page right now. So let's go over here to the description. Um, I know they have the double drive gears here, but I don't believe it's going to require step change. I think they use the same diameter as a stock drive one. So here's the installation and I'm assuming here, they're going to tell you if you need to adjust firmware settings. So let's see here. Okay. So they're telling you how to seat the nozzle, cooling it down, reinstalling and installing the filament guide bracket. I like that. It's a nice little guide bracket. Um, the extension. Okay. So here you do have to set steps for millimeters. So in our, op, in our firmware, there's a, there's like an extra settings, uh, place and it's on all the firmware. It's on unified one and two. I will open up unified two here and just show you, I'm just going to show you a random config. They're, they're, they're all the same options. So in the configuration.h file here, um, Hang on, I got a bunch of other stuff that I don't want to share that's open in my notepad, so let's close it out. Um, so if you scroll down or you can just search this, there's a custom e-steps value. So for that for that machine, you would go and delete these two so it lights up, and then you would change the custom e-steps to 130, and then that will lock it in at the firmware level. You can do it from the LCD screen. Okay, but the problem is if you do it from the LCD screen, that's stored in EEPROM. So if you reset your EEPROM and forget to reset it, then you're going to go back to the stock setting, which is usually 95 on our firmware. Um, so they do have a higher step per millimeter. So it's one, they're saying 130. Um, you could also put it in your starting code, but I would recommend just putting it in your firmware. That way it's in there and you don't ever have to worry about, oh man, did I, did I set that? Is it set correctly? And because you'll get 
under extrusion if you don't change it because their step rate is a lot higher than um than the standard one so let's see here um Henry Lin, what does a high value of Z fade do versus having a value of zero? So zero just disables Z fade. Um, a high value, so the number after, I think it's M420Z and then a number. So if you send an M420Z zero, that disables the fade. If you have anything higher than zero, so one or up, uh, that number tells the firmware how many millimeters, uh, over how many millimeters are we going to fade out auto bed loving. So it's actually slightly modifying how much the Z is moving until eventually there's no ABL compensation happening. So what'll happen is you'll have layers that may instead of 0.2 each one, it might be 0.18, uh, which is small enough where you're probably not going to notice it. But if you set it too low, it tries to do that fading over a very short period of time. And if you're doing a lot of compensation, what'll happen is you'll just get layers that are smushed. Um, Morgan James says, is there a way to smooth out printing with Octoprint? I've got a 32 bit board still having issues with blobbing and rough prints due to stuttering. Um, that's going to be your buffer size. Um, and depending on what firmware you have, we have our firmware set with higher buffer sizes to reduce stuttering. But if your Pi is having significant slowdowns, no amount of buffer size increases are going to fix it you should be using at the very minimum a pi 3b or higher so 3b 3b plus or 4 you should also be using a high quality sd card that's got a minimum read write speed of like 30 to 40 megabytes a second the ones we use they're about 35 to 40 on the writes and over 90 on the reads so also check your uh your usb cable because if your usb cable is like having issues with communication, but it's not drop causing enough to drop. That can be a problem as well. Uh, Michael Mearsman says, is there a way in the firmware to tell if printer is thermal runaway enabled? Um, is there a test to, for thermal runaway? The easiest way to, so on newer versions of Marlin, if you go into the about, if your printer has the about section, some printers don't because they don't have the memory to have those menus. Um, It'll tell you in the thermistor settings, I believe. Don't don't quote me on that. Somewhere in that about menu, it'll tell you if there's thermal runaway on or not. Uh, but the easiest way to test it is disconnect one of the wires from your hot end heater, tell it to heat, and uh, see if it actually uh, see if it actually trips it. If it doesn't trip it within like five minutes, then it's probably safe to assume that it's disabled. If it does trip, then obviously it's enabled. Um, Gary Lambert on your UPS, do you use sine wave or square wave? I think we got a mixture of both. Um, we've got some like mid range APCs and cyber powers, and I think most of them are simulated sine wave. Um, Jerry Martin asks, should a kid start 3d printing, uh, with adult supervision? Yes, that would, I, I would love seeing kids get into this stuff, but you can't just give them a printer and be like, here, here's a new toy. They're not a toy. They're a tool and they require people to supervise the kids and help them because they could literally die if they touch mains power um, or they can get really burnt if they touch the hot end but hopefully if they're smart they'll only do that once or twice before they learn that this is hot um Nick, I'm not sure what you mean. Nick, Nick says, would you use a TFT 3.5 where it has a touchscreen and 12864 LCD? I have one, and I've said this before on other streams. I stopped messing with them because I was testing one to hook up to our easy board, and it killed my board. So um, take that as you will. I know MKS just came out with a 3.5 TFT that's like the Big Tree Tech one, so I want to get my hands on one of those. Um. Jesse Sparks, any plans to support the unified firmware for the Soval SVO3? I don't have one, so there's no plans right now. Um, I've got quite a few machines, and I don't, I don't believe the SVO3 has been very popular. Is that the larger one? I need to look it up because I have SVO2 here. I think that's the larger one. <laughs> yeah, that is the larger one. But I do not have one of those, so I can't be like, oh, yeah, we'll support it. I mean, looking at it, um, I think we looked at this before. Uh, looking at it, it does have um, a standard LCD and 
I'm assuming uh, the same board that they shipped with before, so it shouldn't be hard to get it supported. I just don't have one. I haven't purchased one. Um, Richard L says, because he asked me about an IoT motion sensor, I think I'm too cheap to pay $20 per motion sensor. Well, once you factor in an ESP and all the other stuff, you're getting close to $15, $16 to build your own. So my, my thing was, okay, do I spend $16 and do it myself? And then I also have to run power to it. Or do I just pay 20 bucks for a Z-Wave one that runs off a battery for a couple years? I opted for the one with the battery. Sometimes there's stuff you do yourself. And there's other times where it just makes sense to buy a pre-assembled product. Uh, Matt Connie says, I'm thinking about updating my Troncy X5S with a S Big Tree Tech SKR E3. Do you think that's a good idea? No. If you're going to do that, uh, go get yourself an MKS S Gen L. Um, that's a very, it's been proving to be a very solid, reliable board. Um, the, those of you guys that don't know, MKS makes boards and they've made, been making boards for years, even before Big Tree Tech was out. Um, they had the Gen L, which was an 8-bit board that combined ramps, the ramp shield and the Arduino 2560 into one PCB. They then made the S Gen L, uh, version one, which was a 32-bit version of the Gen L. Then Big Tree Tech copied the S Gen L. And that's where their SKR series started from um, the 1.3, 1.1, 1 1.2. Um, so, but they also have an S Gen L version two. I have the version one of the S Gen L in one of my machines here. It's been running great. I have a Gen L, which is the 8 bit board, in two of my machines here, and they've been running great. And I also have an S Gen L V2 that's going into my ABS machine to replace the SKR 1.4 turbo that died. Um, I got a whopping two months out of that board, but I digress. Um, Tim, have you gotten the offsets for the Mega Zero? I have not, but I guess I guess you're too too busy to measure it yourself, Tony. So let me just do it right now. Either that, or you don't have calipers. Let's see. Let's see what our offsets are. So here's how you measure your sensor offsets. So I have sensor on the, the printer. I'm going to take my calipers. And I'm going to take the tip of the center of the tip of the probe. And we're going to measure here. And I'm just eyeballing it here. It doesn't need to be super exact. So we're at about 52 to the left on X, so that would be negative 52. And then on the front, on Y, we're at right around 19. So 19 in front on Y, what was that, 52 on X? I'm going to write that down. Y19 in front. I think it was 52. Yeah. So there we go. Um I will have to put that in a note here. All right, I'll probably I'll probably end up adding this machine in here to well, into the next release. I think I'll probably just do that because trying to get as many printers off of the old firmware version as possible before the end of the year. Um, anyways, uh, Armills, I have TSA firmware on both my machines, but it sets up the home corner as the max. It sets up the home corner as a max dimension on the bed. And then when it presets print, it goes to the opposite corner. Um, how do you reorient it so X... Okay, I don't know why people get this confused. There's literally a video on here. Your back corner on that printer is not zero, zero. It's not. It never has been. Um, the front left corner 
on your printer is 00. zero. The back right corner on that machine on the under 5 is 220, 220. Don't just, there's nothing, there's no need to change anything. When you tell, when your slicer tells your printer to go to X50, Y50, it's going to go to the front left corner because 00, zero is that. So if Creality sent out firmware where the back corner was 00, zero that's wrong. And we do our firmware correctly here. So if you want to intentionally mess up your firmware and do it incorrectly, then go right ahead. But you don't need to reorient anything. Your front left corner on your printer of the bed is always zero zero. That's the that's the zero. That doesn't mean that's your home point. That just means that's zero zero. Your printers can home to min or max, meaning zero or on the under fives case two twenty on X Y. So two twenty two twenty. That's all it is. So there's settings in the firmware that tells it we're homing to max instead of min. So it takes your bed dimensions that are entered in, which are 220 by 220 on that printer. And then it knows it's at the 220 by 220 location. So where I think people are going to get confused is when they have starting your end code. Uh, like I, when I start my printers, if you're using our easy ABL starting code, it will do a purge line on the front left corner of the bed. Um, that's normal. So if you wanted to do it somewhere else, you don't change it in the firmware, you change it in your starting or end, ending G code. So if you want it to end in the back corner, have the head out of the way, then just put a G28 XY, not a regular G28 because I know home Z, but a G28 space XY. Um, and that will home X and Y to the corner at the end of the print. Um, on those machines, I have at home in the back right corner at the end of the print and then drop the bed down. So, um, Warren James, what software are you editing your firmware with? It didn't look like Visual Studio. Oh no, that's just a text editor I use. I do a lot of my work in that text editor. It's Notepad++. Um, I do do some work in VS Code, but I like Notepad++. Um, operator Tony, I just answered your question. The offset is negative 52 on X and I believe negative 19 on Y because I'm pretty sure if it's in front, I can never remember this. I always have to look it up. Um, yeah, if it's in front of the nozzle, so it'd be negative 52 and negative 19. So for the any cubic mega zero OEM mount. Uh, that printer is only in Unified 1 right now, but I will be getting it moved over to Unified 2. So, but those are the offsets for that. Negative 52 and negative 19. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do. Uh, Alan says the other day you said a S car in a plastic case is bad. Uh, oh no, I'm I'm saying if if something decides to go on that plastic is is something that usually likes to catch on fire, I would much prefer to have something like that in a metal casing. Um, but PLA is not too bad in terms of flammability. Um, ABS on the other hand usually likes to go up. Um, Coffeeology says, should I upgrade to the Noctua fans? No, don't buy Noctua fans unless you want to deal with heat creep and jams. Um, either use the stock ones or go with fans like what we carry that actually have proper airflow. They're not going to be as quiet as the Noctua's, but they're not going to make your printer not work. Um, Jeff Lovell, uh, his BTT board broke. He's buying the TS3D board. Do I need to get a bootloader? No, it comes with one. Um, when I, go, when I go to IMC, when you go to sleep, do I dream about firmware? Uh, no, dear God, no. Um, we're in area is cool. Hey, can you talk about the tweaks you've done with the Chiron you've had? Well, if, uh, letting it sit in the garage for a couple months is a tweak, then that's what I've done with it so far. Um, aside from going over the tinned wires, that video where I posted, uh, you know, stripping back the wires and stuff, that's all I've done to it. I haven't messed with it since then because I've had so much other stuff on my plate. Um, Richard L says, do you see any issue with using a negative E-step value instead of reversing motor direction? What the hell are you doing? Reverse your motor direction. I don't even know if Martin will let you enter a negative E-step. Um, like, ugh. Um, 
Our mail. Sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Just about a cure difference. Yeah, well, a lot of people, the problem is you get people online on Facebook groups telling people that zero zero is the back corner on the printer. If zero zero is the back corner of the printer, let's say you printed and, you know, let's say you printed a Benchy and in your slicer, the, the front of the Benchy was, was facing you. So when you print it, okay, in, in the slicer, the Benchy is facing you. But on the printer, zero zero is in the back right corner. What's going to happen is it's going to print with the back end facing you because it's backwards. Um, so having it home correctly, which is to max on those machines, if you slice it, you know, any model in the front of it in your slicer preview is facing you towards the front of the bed, it should be like that on the printer itself. So if you ever do a print on a machine and the slicer preview of what should be the front of the printer doesn't match what it actually did, then that indicates that something's up with the firmware that's not set correctly. Or you could also have options in your slicer set to like invert, uh, <clears throat> invert an axis, but I don't recommend you do that. It's just have the correct firmware. Um, Pipe Leader says, hey, Tim, I have the U2R1B1 firmware on your under five. Should I upgrade to your latest? Uh, so if you're using U2R1B1, that means you have an easy board. Um, yeah, I would recommend upgrading. I've, I've actually been upgrading all my machines to the latest ones. Um, as far as I know, there's no huge changes or bug fixes between the older one. Like we spent a lot of time polishing up the easy board firmware. Um, so and in general, and I've said this before, um, for firmware on your printer, it's one of those things where if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, there's really not a huge reason to update the firmware on your printer unless there's, um, you know, features you want or a bug fix that's important um, or a bug that affects you. Um, our mills, the games are there. You just have to put the, uh, you have to put a code in on the config file that's not published anywhere. There's actually coded into the firmware an option that turns the games on, but some printers do not have the space to play the games. Uh, but if you put define, like, you know, the pound sign, define, space, games, all in capitals, games underscore mode, it will enable the games. But if you do that on, like, the 8-bit board and stuff, it's not going to, it's not going to fit um, but yeah, like the easy board has it, even the stock 32 bit reality boards, like the 422 and the 427 ones, those have the space. But if you add define, you know, pound define space games underscore mode, um, that will put games on the LCD. So, but if you enable that and then the, you do a compile and it says, you know, there's an error, there's out of space, then you're not gonna be able to do that. So, but I did code that in there. It's just kind of an Easter egg. I'm surprised no one's found that, um, which means they'd be looking at the code. So, but there is a defined statement that if that's detected, it will turn the games on. So that's all the questions right now, unless you guys have other stuff. Uh, it might be a, might be a short stream today. People are not as chatty. I also under, I also, uh, um, I also understand it's Monday, so people are probably at work. Uh, Andrew Humphrey, will you be developing Marlin for the CR6 Boom SE? No, I don't have any plans to do anything with that printer. I did actually, it was kind of painful to do, uh, but I did give Big Tree Tech money because they are one of the companies that actually made a board for the CR6. And the fact that I would have more confidence in a board that Big Tree Tech made over the stock over the stock um creality board tells you how bad the stock creality board is i don't use a cr6 because i'm actually very concerned about the board going up in smoke um i've already replaced the power switch but there's been a lot of people that have literally had their boards catch on fire like flame shot out we're not talking like smoldering where stuff melted we're talking like actual fire shot out of the board so yeah. Um, yeah, I ordered two of their boards, so I guess they'll be here in a month or two. Um, they don't have them on Amazon as fulfilled by Amazon, but they're, uh, they're, they're on their official site. So we'll see. 
I mean, maybe maybe it'll be decent. I mean, I can't, I look at it this way: the stock board is so terrible. I don't know how they could screw it up anymore. Um, Daniel says I purchased titanium heat break for under five from you. Have you made an install video for installing that? Uh, we have not. It would install any other metal hot end is, but basically you take it apart, you remove the stock heat break, and there's literally pictures on the product page. I'm sorry if I'm like kind of not on the ball today, um, but I do actually have a slight headache, and I was hoping, I thought maybe it was a caffeine headache, but apparently not. Um... I typed the wrong thing um, here. So these are, this is the heat break he's talking about. This fits the stock Creality hot end and also like the dual hot end we have. Um, but there's pictures here on what it should look like when it's installed. And there's also notes here where all the alignment should be. So this is it actually in here. So you're literally just going to, unscrew this grub screw and take your stock one out. What I usually do is I'll unscrew these two bolts here to separate the block from the heat sink. Um, I'll unscrew this grub screw and then I'll tell the block to heat, make sure it doesn't touch anything, obviously. And then once the block is hot, then I'll take the heat break out and put the new one in. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple part to replace because you're just taking the stock one out. Now, one thing to know, and this throws off people, because it's an all-metal heat break, the PTFE tube does not go all the way down into the heat break itself. If you actually look at the product photo here, you'll see it's got just a little bit of a well to capture the PTFE, and it actually stops right there. Um, you can see it in here, too. So the PTFE will still go into the heat break, but it doesn't go all the way down into the meld zone. So you, don't wanna, you do want to make sure that seats up in there. Um, you'll feel it like catch the lip and then push it in. So, um, let's see here. Creality Kickstarter shakes head. Yeah, Kickstarters are never a good idea. I don't do Kickstarters. I hate it. Um, Armel says, you went over this before, but I'll go there anyways. I set my yeast steps for a tough extruder 463 and it is over extruding massively. Um, I would double check that it's actually set to 463 in the EEPROM and depending on your printer 463 is for 116 stepping mode so if you have a, a stepping mode of 1 8th would probably 1 8th would would double it um so I don't know what machine you have but I run 463 on all of them I have multiple machines with that extruder on it so if it's over extruding massively that sounds like your slicer is pushing out telling it to push out too much filament um, I use, uh, I, we still are using S3D here and I usually set for PLA a 0.9 extrusion multiplier instead of one. So I know other slicers have those same options in them. So try it like a 90% flow rate and see, um, uh, Great Lakes gun PLA. Um, how do you check a power supply to make sure it's not overtaxed? Uh, the new SVL3 has a 350 watt power supply, but a 350 watt heat or 350 by 350 heated bed. Um, the best way would be is like a current clamp and put it over that tell it to heat. I do have current clamps here, but I don't have that printer, so I can't test it. But just because a bed's big doesn't mean it pulls a ton of current. Usually it does, but it depends on the resistance of the bed. So if you want to see the easiest way, if you have a multimeter and you don't have a current clamp, Measure the resistance of the bed with a disconnector from the control board and see what resistance it is, and then use Ohm's law calculator um, to figure out what wattage it's going to pull, and that'll give you a rough estimate. So, uh, Dominic, my stepper motor is running noticeably hotter since I installed the tough extruder. How hot is too hot? Um, with when you use a geared extruder motor because it's driving that motor harder, that is normal for it to get warmer. Um, how hot is too hot? You should be able to keep your hand on it without getting burned or cause discomfort. Um, they run warm. It's just how it is, especially if you're running a pancake motor, they're going to run warm with a geared extruder. And even the stock motors run warm. You can either decrease your V-Ref um, or check to see how um, check to see how hot it is. Uh, most stepper motors can handle 90 to 100 degrees Celsius. So uh, the concern there, though, is if you're using a printed mount, it's not ABS, then you could warp the mount if you're using Petchy or PLA. 
Iron Mills, if you if you're calibrated E steps to setting it to four or three works, then just set it and run with it. Um, without seeing the printer, I couldn't tell you why yours is much lower. Um, uh, Gabe says, I recently saw a BL touch on my Ender 3. I probed the bed and saved the E-Prime. It'll move the Z-axis. I even have the offset dialed in, but well leveling is wildly inconsistent. I would run an M48 test to see if that probe is actually getting good accuracy. Um, the one reason among a few why I don't like the BL touches is because the, the cabling they use is thin, unshielded cabling, so it can pick up interference. And the thing is, if you're picking up interference, it can throw off the accuracy of it, which means your bed mesh is not going to be usable. Um, but if you run the M48 test, you can get a baseline of what the accuracy of the probe is. Sometimes you could just have a de defective probe. There's a lot more chances for those to be defective because they do have moving parts. So if something's not moving correctly or consistently um, or smoothly, then you can get inaccuracies introduced because it's it's got physical moving parts. Um, but like the one, the, the two causes for a BL touch being inconsistent is, well, if you have a clone, the clones are usually garbage quality. Um, if you're going to get a BL touch, buy the original one. Don't buy the clones. Um, but it's either the cabling's picking up interference or there's something physical on it. Um, Andrew is asking, will you be doing a bit a video on the Big Tree Tech board for the CR6? I probably will do a stream just putting it in and see. Um, but honestly, I'm a little worried. Like, Big Tree Tech's firmware is usually pretty bad. So I don't know how much of a headache it's going to be. Um, on the bright side, I think if I change the board out to theirs, I could actually use a standard LCD. Um, uh, Morgan says, I want to fill, fill in sensor for my Ender 3 Pro, the big Tree Tech E3 Mini, and I saw you have an easy off for it. What does the little board do in the setup? The board changes around the wiring so that sensor works correctly with the board. So if you see our easy out, if you plug our easy out sensor, like if you get just the sensor and plug it into your board, it will short the board out. So um, they're just off the shelf sensors and we made the adapter boards so they can work with multiple different machines. So those boards are changing wiring configurations around. So it's literally plug and play. There's a little extension cable. You plug that into our board. Uh, the other end goes into the control board. Then you plug the sensor into our board. And there's a little piece of heat shrink that goes over it so it doesn't short anything out. Um, let's see here. Das said his CR6 SKR board had a short. Had to replace diode, diode D1 and MOSFET Q2. That fixed it. You shouldn't have to do that. They should be testing their stuff. <sighs> Let's see. Uh, Super Sport. I'm going to need more details like what printer you're using. Um, I just upgraded from Unified version 1 to 2. Now SD1 in it. Unless I plug my into my USB. Plug the USB into my PC first. If I boot from USB, power the card works fine. If I boot from wall, it says SD and it failed. I don't think that's a firmware issue because it's the first time I've heard, heard of it. But I also don't know what printer you're using. But it sounds like you have a grounding problem. Because if... If there wasn't a if there was a proper ground, then plugging the USB into the computer shouldn't be affecting the functionality of the SD card. So um, it sounds like you got a bad ground in your machine. You need to check your wiring uh, because what happens is when you plug the USB into there, it's getting ground through your your USB cable. Your USB cable has a the outer casing that you see the metal part of the plug that's ground. So it sounds like. It sounds like there's an issue with the grounding on that machine and that should be corrected because that could be potentially dangerous. So this guy keeps adding the same. I already answered your question. So we're going to go ahead and remove that. Um, the answer is no, don't waste money on Noctua fans because you're going to get heat creep. Um, but yeah, super sport sounds like, sounds like that's an issue with the grounding. Um, Armil says my M wait. No, that's a different guy. Armil says my M48 returns a 0 0.002 every time. Doesn't fluctuate by much, but it is always 0 0.002. That is more than accurate enough, right? Yes. Uh, in order, you want 0 0.01 millimeters or less for 
consistently, so under 0 0.01 millimeters or less to be accurate. Um, that's what you want, and that's what you'll get with the Easy ABL. If everything's set up correctly, everything's mounted correctly, you will get really low ac really low deviation, which is high accuracy. Uh, Morgan James, have you ever used closed loop steppers? Do you have thoughts on them? Um, I haven't used them. I think they're something that is getting more affordable. Um, but my whole thing is if you're losing steps on your machine, then there's usually an issue that needs to be solved, either a VREF or a mechanical problem. So my, my whole thing with that is if you do have closed loop steppers on there, at what point does it just start covering up issues with the printer um, that you're not aware of till something catastrophically fails? Um, like, yeah. So, but yeah, our mills, it, 0 0.002 is really good. So anything under 0 0.01, no matter what sensor, our sensor or other sensor, anything under 0 0.01 is a good deviation. So it's where you start getting higher than that, or it's like all over the place. Like that's something that you want to check your wiring. You want to check your calibration. If it's a sensor that needs to be calibrated, that kind of stuff. So... But anyways, um, I am going to wrap this up because my headache's actually getting worse now, uh, which is weird. Uh, I think I just actually need to eat something. So, But I appreciate you guys to stop by. We have a stream tomorrow at, I believe it's 4 p.m. Uh, for the Homer's Tarantula RS. I'm just double checking. I believe it's 4 p.m. Let me see when I have it scheduled. It says it's just telling me December 8th, but I believe it's 4 p.m. Central. Hang on. I thought I said it for a little bit later in the day. Uh, come on, where is it? Oh, 5 p.m. Sorry, 5 p.m. Central. So tomorrow there will be a stream for the Homer's Tarantula RS, and we'll be doing that. And then Wednesday again, we'll be back with another Ask Tim. And I think we might do one depending on how busy we are Um and whatnot and or sorry I, yeah i'm having a hard time focusing but it's just like right here um there might be a stream later this week either on thursday or friday because i do have a couple machines to go over um one of them being the uh the svo2 and the i3 or not the i3 the anycubic mega zero two so anyways i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap this up i'm gonna go have something to eat hopefully that'll help um, I just had a protein shake today. That's it. So, but I appreciate everybody stops by. I hope you guys had some fun. I hope you guys learned something and as always happy printing.